Good evening. You're watching PBS 39. I'm your host, Tony Kayumi, and this evening's Women's Health Line is going to be on chronic pelvic pain and interstitial cystitis. Our guest this evening is Dr. Jeffrey Gly, and he is here to uh, tell you anything that you want to know about the subject, so you can feel free to call in at any time and ask your questions or share your comments by dialing the number on the screen. But first, before we go to the phone calls, I want to do our question of the day. So if I could have that screen up, please. Our question of the day, there we go. There are three important elements which distinguish chronic pelvic pain. What are they? We'll have that answer for you later on in this evening's show. Dr. Clyde, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Could you start us off by telling us what interstitial, interstitial cystitis is? Sure, and, and as it's a very difficult name to say. A lot of people abbreviate that name, interstitial cystitis, with IC. And it's a chronic bladder condition that starts off as very mild and mimics urinary tract infections and progresses without treatment to severe bladder and pelvic pain. Now, how does it differ, I guess, in symptomology mm -hmm. from urinary tract infections so you would know that it was IC rather than a UTI? Sure. Uh, in the beginning, it starts out in many women just as a sense that they need to urinate more often. So a lot of people think that that is how it's a urinary tract infection. They go to their physician, they get medication, they feel a little better, but the tip-off is that the culture that was negative, so there's really no bacteria there, or that they get better for a short time and it seems to come back. Now, with a UTI, you have that horrible burning sensation. Mm -hmm. Do you have that with uh, IC as well? As it progresses, absolutely, and that's where it becomes really problematic for women because not only are they urinating much more frequently, some women may urinate up to 20 to 30 times a day, which is about um, several times an hour. Most people urinate six to eight times a day. So in the beginning, it starts off with frequency, and then it progresses to that, that, that painful urination. And even some women say they urinate, and uh, just a minute later, they feel like they gotta go again, and it burns really bad until they try. Now, if it's not bacterial caused, mm -hmm. like a UTI, and you're given the antibiotic as you would for a UTI, or you take the over-the-counter pain reliever, which temporarily takes away the burn, mm -hmm. um, would the antibiotics make any effect to mm -hmm. the symptomology? Usually they help a little bit along with the um, other medication that women get for the burning, which is called peridium. It turns the urine an orange mm -hmm. color and it kind of numbs the, the bladder and the urethra. So that's kind of what really helps. It helps calm it down for a while. Um, if, if I always tell the patients that if they keep going back to their doctor for recurrent infections and just can't seem to get a handle on it, that's when they got to start thinking that something else might be going on. Unfortunately, this is a condition that I just recently learned about several years ago in residency we may have had one page devoted to this in the textbook. That was um, back in 96 to 2000. So it's, it's a, a new thing that we're really raising the awareness for, for over the last several years. And it's, it's uh, something that not all physicians yet have really grabbed onto and understand. So part of tonight is trying to just raise the awareness and let patients know and let any physician out there know that there, there is something we can do to help these patients. Okay, so if I had what I thought were several UTIs, and I just keep getting them, keep getting them, mm -hmm. the cultures are negative for the bacteria, mm -hmm. uh, so then the physician would perhaps suspect that it's CI. Then, I see. I see, pardon mm -hmm. me. Then what type of test uh, can be done to, to verify that for sure? Sure, and, and I'll, I'll go back up a little sure. bit to the symptoms in addition to the, the you know, seem the uh, urinary tract infections that you're trying to get treated for, you would also notice that you're urinating a lot more. And your, your husband or your partner may say, gosh, you're always going to the bathroom. You may have to stop on, on your way just to the mall to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, you also may have pain with intercourse because the bladder is actually being uh, irritated during intercourse. Or you may just have irritation in the pelvis um, throughout the month. And sometimes it gets uh, worse with your periods. The next step would be to talk with either your gynecologist or a urologist. Urologists are the specialized in bladder treatment. But what I find is a lot of women don't have a urologist. They have a gynecologist, an obstetrician, and a family doctor. So that's where we come in because sometimes we're the first line and we can then either do some testing in the office or point them in the direction of a urologist if they need to go that far. 
And then the type of testing that would be done is? We, we have a, a symptom scoring scale that we will ask a whole bunch of questions, trying to relate some of your symptoms, see if you have many of the symptoms of IC. And then we can do a, a catheter test in the office, which will tell us if your bladder is irritated. And we inject some potassium water just through the catheter. The catheter burns a little bit. And most people, if they have interstitial cystitis, when the potassium water touches their bladder, they would feel some burning. So we would immediately take that out. And then we put in some uh, medicine in the bladder, kind of like Pepto-Bismol for the bladder, to coat the bladder. And most people get about a three-day instant relief once we start that process. And then from there, we can do other therapies that will help a lot. And could you tell me what those therapies would be? Sure. Um, the peridium we talked about, mm -hmm. that in terms of urine orange, helps a great deal. Uh, there's some medicine that's specially for IC that helps. It takes three months to kick in. So I usually recommend if a patient has this, they come into the office up to three times a week and we can put that Pepto-Bismol in the bladder and they'll get instant relief. The hardest part, but also the easiest part, is to change their diet. Unfortunately, the foods and drinks that, that we eat and drink cause a chemical as it gets passed into the urine to irritate the bladder. And if you change some of the stuff you eat and drink, you'll notice a big difference. And so that aspect being similar to UTIs and the highly acidic things causing the problems? Exactly, exactly. And, and if I could show the one picture, I can sure. kind of show the, the bladder lining. What we're looking at is the lining of the bladder and that um, kind of pink with stuff with the black little spots in it is the, the bladder lining. And the blue you see on top of that is this mucus layer. And you can kind of see an erosion in the top, middle of the screen, and down to the left. And that's what happens in IC. It's very similar to um, stomach problems or stomach ulcers. You get these little ulcers in the bladder, and when the things we eat or drink turns into chemicals, waste products by the kidneys, comes into the bladder and hits those raw spots and burns. And the medicine will then fill in those raw spots like Pepto-Bismol would for your stomach. So caffeine, alcohol, what other no-nos would there be? All the good things. Yeah, all the good things, the I know. <laughs> so chocolate. It, unfortunately, chocolate. <laughs> I'm listing favorite things here. <laughs> yeah, chocolate, caffeine, pop, uh, coffee, teas, um, uh, cheeses, many fruits, uh, a few vegetables, um, smoked meats, canned meats, cured meats, processed foods, processed drinks, cause this this pain and what I usually tell patients is if they can stick it out for usually three to six months and really try to change their diet and get on the medicine by that time the medicines kicked in and then they can reintroduce coffee and caffeine and, and cheese and and chocolate slowly I have, I have one patient who found in the beginning a quarter cup of coffee a day would give her three days of pelvic pain and she was in agony and sometimes couldn't work now that she's been on the medicine for about three to six months, she's able to reintroduce the coffee and she can have it again and not have pain. Now, would this be the medicine similar to some um, acid reflux medications that you need to take it for the rest of your life type of thing? That's exactly the same concept. This is a condition. We can kind of calm it down. We don't know how to cure it, just like the acid reflux. You probably take that medicine for a while and you'll feel much better and you may be able to get off the medicine, but at some point in time, you know that if you, you eat some spicy foods or something, it comes back. And so this is the same type of thing. That's interesting. I mean, for two different related body parts, it's similar in the reaction. Yeah, I, I kind of wonder if there is, a, is some type of a link because nobody knows what causes it. We, we think it might be some of the environmental things, some of the chemicals that we, we eat, we breathe, and same with the, the stomach. It's just after a while, after time, our stomach linings can't handle it or our bladder linings can't handle it. Now, in regards to the medications, um, if, for instance, you would stop for a while because you know you get that feeling, oh, yeah, I'm better, I don't need mm -hmm. it anymore, and then it comes back, would you have to start all over from the beginning again with the Pepto-Bismol-like coating thing and then changing the diet and then the medication? Yeah, you would. In the Pepto-Bismol coating, the catheter treatments we do in the office, I leave that up to the patients. I have some patients who do that once a week in the beginning. I have some patients who do it three times a week, and some will only come in once a month. So that's really an individual thing on when they feel like they need it. Uh, the one patient I mentioned earlier was funny because she was going to a bachelor party, and she knew she would drink some beer. 
So she came in Friday. We did the Pepto-Bismol thing in her bladder so she could have an enjoyable bachelor party. So it is a, in a way, in a sense, that you can do some preventative measures from stopping yes. the pain from coming if you know you're going to misbehave yes. on your diet. Yes, and, and I, I have to have coffee every morning, so I, I, I wouldn't expect someone else to give it up forever. So sometimes you've got to either drink some coffee or have some chocolate. So separate from the lifestyle changes with your diet and is separate from the medications that we mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, what are some other therapeutic things that can be done? Physical therapy and exercise are fantastic. Every, everybody should exercise. We, we harp on that a lot. Um, but physical therapy, in addition to that, strengthening the muscles of the pelvis, strengthening the body, I, I believe it has something to do with strengthening the immune system and how healthy the body is as well. I believe we have a caller who's okay. on hold, so we're going to go to line one, where I think Fred is waiting for us. Hi, Fred. How are you this evening? Oh, I'm pretty good. Did you have a question for Dr. Cly? I was just wondering if, uh, you know, men can suffer from the, the, the same conditions that you're describing. Uh, absolutely, and that, that's an excellent question because a lot of times some of these conditions affect men and they, they're just not sure and, and we as men don't like to speak up sometimes. Um, but yes, it does affect men. It affects a, a smaller number of men, but definitely a, a good number of men. And the same, these medicines can be taken by men and will make a huge difference. And I would encourage you to talk with a urologist. There's two excellent groups in town who have some people who specialize in IC uh, for men. Thanks for your call, Fred. We were just briefly touching on the physical therapy and exercise aspect of the therapy. Uh, in regards to types of exercises, would those be like core strengthening exercises yes. like Pilates and some yoga moves? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the core strengthening is fantastic. The just generalized body exercise, aerobic type of exercise is fantastic. And then along with the physical therapy, there's special exercises to strengthen the, the muscles of the pelvis. And every, many women know about the, the good old Kegels maneuver, mm -hmm. but I refer to the pelvic therapy, physical therapy exercises as the super Kegels because it, it just tones up the whole pelvis. And so would they literally be given a prescription then to go to a physical yeah. therapist to have these exercises taught to them? Absolutely. There's, there's several female physical therapists in town, and all they do is female physical therapy. They will check a woman like a physician, a gynecologist would, would feel, and they'll feel the pelvic muscles. And they will uh, figure out what muscles are either weak or causing pain or trigger points and can make a huge difference in helping a woman with pain uh, another subject of prolapse and incontinence. And even if it's not IC, sometimes women have a pulled groin mus muscle that they've seen many doctors for thinking that that pain is, is either their bowels or their uterus or their ovaries. And really they have simply just a pulled groin muscle. And once the physical therapist identifies that, uh, many women can find total relief for their symptoms. We have another caller on hold, so we're going back to the phones where Mary is waiting. Hi, Mary. Hi, uh, doctor. I've I always heard that if you have a urinary tract infection, that if you um, drink cranberry juice a lot or you take cranberry like pills, that it's something that can help prevent this from happening. Is that true? Yeah, that, that is true. The cranberry juice increases the acidity in the urine and that helps to ward off or fight the bacteria. A lot of women have told me that if they start feeling symptoms of a urinary tract infection, and they get on the cranberry juice right away that they can cure it with the cranberry juice. So that is true. And the condition of interstitial cystitis, increased acidity in the, in the urine is bad. So if, if you're if someone who gets a urinary tract infection once every blue moon, definitely get on that cranberry juice as soon as you can. But if you're getting them every month uh, and you, you can't seem to find an answer, the cranberry juice can be worsening the symptoms. Thank you for your call, Mary. Another thing I had heard, and I don't know, is this mythology or is this the truth, that uh, the style of underwear that some women wear, the thongs, mm -hmm. actually contribute to UTIs and problems of this nature? Yeah, th th that is true. Because what it is is more it's, it's the tight tightness against the skin of the pelvis. And it can be either locking in moisture or it could be kind of rubbing the bacteria along the urethra because there is normal bacteria in the vaginal tract and if it gets kind of pushed into the urethra it kind of makes its way up into the bladder and causes the urinary tract infection. I know there are also some basic um, hygiene tips as well mm -hmm. if you could share those. Absolutely. Um, when urinating we always recommend 
when you wipe, wipe front to back so you're not pulling any bacteria from the rectum region into the bladder. After intercourse, recommend urinating because the intercourse can allow bacteria to get up into the urethra. Those are two, two probably of the most common ones. Um, and then just trying to wear proper clothing. Uh, if you're a swimmer, trying to make sure that you're not walking around all day with you know damp underwear or dampness down there, that encourages a yeast infection. And then if you are in the jacuzzi or the bath a lot, again, making sure that you, you get dryness and, and maybe powder or air to that area so it doesn't encourage that yeast to grow. I've also heard that the fabric makes a big difference, cotton versus mm -hmm. synthetic, that cotton is the way to go if, if this is a habitual problem for you. Exactly. Cotton lets the body breathe better. Now, you briefly mentioned um, overactive bladders. Mm -hmm. You can't watch TV these days without seeing, you know, if you're right. watching commercial television versus public television, an ad for overactive bladder. Right. How does that play a part and how does it differ from what we're talking about with IC? Uh, let's say the IC would be an extreme overactive bladder. Because I have seen patients who don't have the pain component, but they have to go to the bathroom every 15 minutes. And at first, that's what they think it is, overactive bladder. They get treated for that, and it doesn't work. It doesn't get better. That's when they would want to think about IC. An overactive bladder is very common. And so I would encourage people not to think after this program that they have IC, but if you are having increased urination or on the drive home you, ha you, you, you barely can make it to the bathroom, there are the overactive bladder medications might be proper for them. Or again, physical therapy can make a huge difference in overactive bladder and people can sometimes avoid medication altogether. In regards to other issues involving chronic pain in the pelvic area, endometriosis can also mm -hmm. come into play. Could we touch on that subject as well? Uh, th that's a great question. Unfortunately, endometriosis and IC are usually found together 60 to 80 percent of the time, depending on which study that you look at. And I have actually canceled some hysterectomies after learning about this procedure because I thought it was endometriosis. Once I actually learned about this procedure, took some classes, figured out what it was, I came back to the office, called a couple patients and said, this is what I think you have, and truly it was what they have, and we've been able to not do some procedures. Unfortunately, endometriosis uh, it does occur many times, 60 to 80 percent with this. So I always encourage anybody who has an endometriosis diagnosis, before they go drastic and have the hysterectomy and taking their ovaries out, just evaluate whether I see as a part of it. Now, for those who are watching who may not know what endometriosis is, if you could define that. Sure. Endometriosis is the menstrual lining, menstrual tissue that's supposed to come outside the body every month in the form of a period. But instead, some of it gets inside the body cavity, and it has its own little mini period every month inside on the tissues, around the bowels, around the ovaries, around the bladder. And it causes swelling and pain because it's trying to bleed internally every month. And it causes severe cramps, severe pain. Usually starts uh, before the menstrual cycle and during, and subsides after for a few weeks, and then tries to build up again. I do believe we have another caller in the hole. Sure. We're going back to the phones this time. It's Joyce's turn. Hi, Joyce. Hi. Hello. Would you like to share your question with Dr. Cly? Yes, I would. I have a question. Okay, I had a hysterectomy over a year ago, and I keep having UTIs. And would that be like one of the side effects for having a hysterectomy? And I also have like um, leakage bladder also. Sure. Th thank you very much for your question. Um, the hysterectomy m may have been very proper and done for the right reason. The bladder symptoms you're noticing now could be that it could be a relationship to wh what we're talking about tonight, the IC. I would also encourage you to talk with your doctor about could there be any scar tissue on the bladder as a result from the hysterectomy or from the healing from the hysterectomy causing the, these issues. And then I don't know if they did any uh, graft procedures or bladder lifts at that time because sometimes after those procedures there can also be some scarring in the bladder itself from those procedures. Um, and urinary incontinence unfortunately does increase sometimes after hysterectomy. It usually depends on how well supported your pelvis, pelvic tissues were before the hysterectomy, but it can be fixed. Thanks for your call, Joyce. I know one of the other things that can cause chronic pelvic pain is fibroids. Mm -hmm. 
uh, if we could talk a little on that subject as well. Sure. Fibroids are a, a initially start as one cell, a muscle cell from the uterus that grows uncontrollably. And most women have a couple of fibroids, and most of the time they stay about the size of a penny or a quarter. Some women have uh, fibroids that grow very large, could be the size of an a orange, a plum, uh, even a basketball. Usually when they get to be a large enough size to the size of a plum or, or even maybe a large grape, they can start causing uh, symptoms such as cramping with periods, irregular uterine bleeding, even pelvic pressure. And that's uh, many times when a woman comes in because she hasn't noticed it until that point. And then as far as treatment for fibroids? There's a lot of new things out there for, for treatment. The, the older methods, which still work very well, are hysterectomy, taking the uterus out, myomectomy, taking the fibroids out. There is, a radiologist can take a catheter and actually block off the blood supply to the fibroids and just shrink the fibroids themselves. There are some new MRI procedures that are trying to blast the fibroids with MRI and ultrasound waves. We haven't seen that around this area of the country yet, and I don't know how successful that'll be in the long term, but it's something on the horizon. Now, before Joyce's phone call, when we were talking about endometriosis, you mentioned um, hysterectomies as, as being a potential solution to that. Other, are there other less drastic Yes. solutions and, and if we could discuss those. Well sure, uh, usually what we'll, we'll see endometriosis, in, I'm talking generally, start in a woman who's young, or late teens or early 20s and it starts with very painful periods and cramps. At that point in time, they, most, uh, many women haven't had their, their family yet. So we'll start by using birth control pills or maybe some medicine to turn off the hormones and temporarily turn off the endometriosis to let them heal for a few months or even a surgical evaluation with just a laparoscopy taking a look and cleaning up scar tissue, endometriosis, or adhesions. And then we'll maintain them on birth control medicines to, to minimize the endometriosis until at which point that they may choose to do a hysterectomy or may choose to, to do something else. We do have another caller on hold, so it's back to the telephones where Susie is waiting. Hi, Susie, Hello. how are you? Fine, thank you. I was wondering if the doctor could talk about how hysterectomies are done, uh, opening the abdomen or going up through the vagina? Sure. Um, th that's a good question. And uh, a couple months ago, I was here talking about some of those different types of, of ways of doing hysterectomies. The, the oldest form is opening the abdomen, doing an abdominal hysterectomy, kind of making an incision like a C-section. Uh, many women can have a vaginal hysterectomy. Usually that's when the uterus isn't too large and the patient doesn't have a lot of adhesions where we can take the uterus out through the vagina so you don't have a large incision in the abdomen. And uh, most recently there is a new uh, system which allows us to, to use some new technology to take women or allow women who would have had to have an abdominal hysterectomy in that C-section incision, now they could have a laparoscopic assisted vaginal hysterectomy and instead of having two days in the hospital they're in the hospital 23 hours and instead of six weeks off of work and two weeks they can't drive they're actually back to work or back to normal in one to two weeks and they can drive the next day thanks so much for your call Susie and in closing if you could just tell us any final words or, or points that you wanted to get across in regards to interstitial cystitis sure I would encourage anyone who's struggling with pelvic pain, bladder pain, pain with intercourse, frequent urination, to talk with their family doctor or gynecologist to see if they can find a, a source so they can live life again. It, it's most of the time we can help a woman get back to feeling normal, having sex without pain, and not having to take medicine all month or, or a, go home from work because they're having too much pain. So if you're having a challenge, talk with your doctor. Don't suffer in silence, right, right? Right. And I think that's an issue with a lot of people. They're embarrassed about some topics right. to talk to their doctor. Right. And I think that hopefully having shows like this evening's will encourage people to, to speak out because there is an answer out there. Absolutely. And speaking of questions and answers, we do have to do our follow up, our answer to the question that we posed earlier this evening. The question was there are three important elements which distinguish chronic pelvic pain. What are they? 
the answers. One, at least three months of pain. Two, elimination of other conditions, such as damage to the pelvic organs. And three, the pain is severe enough to limit a woman's life activities. Dr. Cly, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your time.